Hi, this is Mikkel. I'm based out of Panama, Canadian citizen, but live in Panama full time. Wonderful. Uh, thanks for joining me. Really appreciate it. I think uh, with my my first thought with you, because you are a world traveler, you've been to over 100 countries, you've lived in many countries. Mm -hmm. My first thought with with you is, and and you advise people on how to uh, diversify their living arrangements. So my thought is with you is. In times like this, in crisis like this, everybody has to stay put in a way, but they probably have their eye on the future. What, what does your pipeline look like? Are people reaching out to you about um, this next phase once we get out of this? Yeah. So, okay. First off the bat, like we deal a lot with moving to different countries. You know, I run a website. Actually, I run a couple of websites. I run one called Escape Artist and the second one is called The Expat Money Show. It's basically the podcast. Um, so obviously we're not having a lot of the inquiries. We're not having a lot of the stuff right now about how to move to the country right now, you know, and plus we put up tons of content about the different countries and things like that. Um, obviously a lot of that has slowed down. Like we've seen a slowdown in the traffic to the websites, but what has come up on the other side is a lot more of the asset protection. So a lot of people are very concerned about the steps that some of the governments have taken um, they're very concerned about protecting their wealth. So we're doing a lot of things with corporate structures these days, with trusts, with foundations, with LLCs, with IBCs, any of these types of things, and specifically offshore. Um, I'd say that it's just like a slight change in the focus, what people are looking at. But I expect our numbers to go through the roof as people have a better sense of personal responsibility. Um, I think that that's really come through with a lot of what we're going, what's going on in the world right now with the COVID-19. Yeah, it's interesting, especially being in a, back in America um, and then listening to the rhetoric of our healthcare system and the security within it, but then being somebody where we had, we had the opportunity to experience other health, healthcare systems around the world mm -hmm. and found how strong they are. And yeah. I think that it's one of these things where, depending upon where you are in the Western world, um, everybody thinks that their healthcare is the best. And especially in America- It's a national pride. With a lot of people, it's a very, sub, it's a very sensitive subject and it, it, it's a national pride. I'm Canadian and I know a lot of Canadians just think that their healthcare system is like the greatest thing in the whole wide world. I'm like, okay, but you have to wait six months to see a specialist and the hospitals are 30 years old. and. Like I know that the doctors are very well trained and the nurses are very well trained and they're certainly working their butts off right now. But when you have government run programs like nationalized healthcare, I don't think that's the most effective way to run these types of things. If you look at privatized systems and you know, you've traveled heaps as well, look at places like Korea, look at like any of the privatized medicine there and what you get. Go to Mexico, go to lots of these different countries. And when you pay, you are getting much better services. Yeah, and in a lot of the, uh, we've had a chance to to go to Bangkok, and, mm -hmm. um, Bumrungrad. It's it's world renowned hospital where yeah, a lot of case the case point. Yeah, a lot of the educated um, physicians there are um, U.S. educated or Western educated. Mm -hmm. Come back to to Thailand to to practice, and mm -hmm. it's it's you see people from all over the world that are there um, getting their treatments, and that's what one of the things that I think gets lost is it's one of those weird things that. We want to we want to have that security in America, but what I'm seeing that they're tr they're attempting to fly people back to America during mm -hmm. these these uh, quarantine times. I don't know if if Nikki and I would have been traveling during this this phase and this would have broke out. I'm not sure if we would have stayed put, based on so, how good the the healthcare is in Singapore, or Japan, or or Thailand, mm -hmm. like I described, or if we would have flew back just to have that security because. A lot of things as you travel is having that base, right? Just having a comfort level of the things that that you that are around you. I guess can you talk about that because you've traveled so much as well, and now you you've relocated to Panama. What talk about that comfort level within those first couple of months that is sometimes difficult to get into that rhythm, um, especially when something like this hits. Yeah, like okay, for example. Like we said, I live in Panama. When we first arrived here about eight months ago, nine months ago, um, we had a pretty medical, pretty serious medical situation. And we went to the hospital, it was privatized, and it's a John Hopkins. So, I mean, this is like class A hospital, and it's within walking distance from my house, you know? Um, I feel quite secure with that. 
we were lucky at the time because uh, we had a very good friend who came and took care of us. Well, we didn't speak very much Spanish when we arrived. Now I'm quite fluent after eight, eight months, nine months of studying. So I think that language can definitely be a barrier. I think with a lot of the premium hospitals, though, you'll have a lot of English speaking staff. Most of the doctors, like every doctor I go to here, even my chiropractor, they all studied in the United States. So their English is like top notch, but it is something to consider. Um, as to your point about, you know, if you were traveling uh, overseas and this broke out, what do you do? You know, I had, a, I had a very good friend who was traveling through Paraguay and Uruguay and places like this and actually decided to fly back to Dallas before they closed the borders. And I was quite surprised because the U.S. is one of, well, is the most worst hit areas on the planet. Like, like when you look at the numbers now compared to China, the U.S. is just like threefold, fourfold what's happened in China. And we're just starting. And you're just starting, exactly. Like the new cases are, God, I don't even know. I didn't look today, but maybe 80,000 new cases or something like that in the last week. It's like, like that's mad. Like, that's just crazy. I don't think that's the place that I would want to fly back to. Again, Canada is no better. Mm. Um, where a little tiny South American country that no one's really ever heard of that doesn't have a lot of industrialization, not industrialization, but internationalization. You know, they're pretty isolated. I would have thought that was a great place to stay. But I guess it's a personal decision at the at the end of the day. Yeah, and I think that um, especially when it comes to maybe some of your clientele, the the unknowns of what we're going into. Because if this thing bubbles back up, or they're just an unknown of it bubbling back up, how will people potentially get back home? Because I know even we've got some travel planned. We we were we were supposed supposed to go to Mexico um, mm -hmm. last week, and then we were we have travel plans to Morocco. In, um, mm -hmm. in a couple Beautiful of, country. Yeah, in a couple of months. We're not sure if it's going to happen. And a lot of the concern with travelers is if, first, will they even allow us as Americans to come in because our cases are so high at this point? And will mm -hmm. there be that 14 day quarantine, which that would make for a, a horrible um, vacation anywhere you go in the world? But then if we get there and then something happens, will we get to come back home? Are yeah. you, are, that, are those the conversations you're having with your client base now? No, the majority of my clients have stopped all travel. Like I, I've, stopped all travel this year. We were supposed to go to Portugal and Spain actually this week. We've had to cancel all our plans. We're supposed to, we always go back to China. My wife is from mainland China. So we go back, you know, usually three, four times a year. We've had to cancel all of those trips. I'm supposed to speak at an event in Thailand. Um, I should probably actually tell him that I won't be going to that as well. Um, we've canceled for the whole year because I think that anybody who thinks that in a couple of months we're going to get back to normal is sorely mistaken. You know, we're at the very, very beginning here. Um, and I, I would encourage people to start preparing and, and to get that through their head. Um, life as we know it is it's going to be fundamentally different. Just like after 9-11, the whole world changed. After this, the whole world is going to change. And I expect similar type of things. When the Patriot Act came into play, I think we'll see a lot of very drastic uh, measures by governments, not just the U.S., but all over the world um, with travel, with tourism, with freedom of movement. So I'd be very mindful of that. I'm in the same boat. Uh, it's not a pessimic, pessimistic view, but it's more of a realistic view mm -hmm. where um, I think um, we're, it's like ingrained in, in us today to want to get results very fast. And mm -hmm. this is not the case when it comes to a virus like this, or even uh, something that has to do with the health, you have to have a little bit of patience. And I, I can see us every, every day we're trying to find the end of this. And it's mm -hmm. one of those things where you just gotta have patience to sit through it and wait it out and not be rushed. Because I think the more that we rush it, the longer it's gonna take. And then if this thing takes a really long time, then you're gonna see some really um, huge financial implications of, of um, not only beyond America, but globally. And that's the other thing too, is it's no longer, these nations don't sit in isolation when it comes to their finances. We're, we're, it's a global economy. And we, we lay, yeah. we, we, um, there's a re lot of reliance on China because mm -hmm. of manufacturing there, but there's also uh, with, with a lack of activity in a country like America and all of Europe right now, everybody's just in a wait and see to, to, to make that next step. Yeah. But Globalization is here to stay. There's no question about that. No, no country is in, an island on itself, you know, there's no country that is self-reliant. 
Um, everybody is dependent on each other. That's for sure. And when you look at the breakdown in supply chains of products that are coming out of China, that's, that's intense. Now, I understand that a lot of the Chinese factories, the workers have gone back, which is wonderful. I'm going to be quite concerned about any types of the shipping lines. Um, you know, you get the crew on something like that, that'll be sick. You're going to have problems with the port authorities, with the customs. You know, like I said, I live in Panama. This is how many billions of dollars worth of goods come through the Panama Canal. How much is things going to be delayed? Look at Amazon. Amazon's not shipping to certain places. They won't ship to freight forwarders anymore. I have to, for my freight forwarder, it's now getting sent to the guy's house um, mm -hmm. who actually runs the freight forwarding because Amazon's flagged these areas and won't send anymore. They put um, limits on how much people can buy. You know, I wanted to buy four little stands to prop my computer screen up, but they've just arbitrarily said, no, you can't have four. You can only have three. It's like, but I have three monitors in front of me and my business partner over there has three mo or two monitors there. So I need five of these actually. It's like, exactly. but I can't buy them. It's like, it's ridiculous, you know? And all of these types of regulation and things that are going to come in, these are just very, very small examples. But I mean, when you start thinking about the micro and then build up from there and look at the macro, like this is, this is going to change the whole world. Absolutely. And we were talking about earlier that, that through the process of, of people working from home in, in jobs that aren't traditionally working from home, yeah. you're going to see a, a large expansion of, of workforce potentially continue to do that, uh, continue on that path. And mm -hmm. then if that, um, last for a long period of time, I think you're going to see a lot of companies saying, okay, we're paying an American this type of money for this job that could probably be outsourced to Ukraine. Can definitely or be or outsourced. India, that yeah. you're going to start to see. Um, there's already been a move of, of certain types of occupations that way. I think we're going to see more um, as this thing continues to progress. I would definitely agree with you. And I would also be looking at you know, websites like Upwork who do all their, you know, it's a freelancer website. You know, I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on staff on there. Um, I think that they'll do very well. I would be very concerned if I was in commercial real estate at the moment. Like, I think that a lot of those companies like WeWork are just going to go bust. There's no way that they're going to be able to sustain this. Um, yeah, there's a lot of businesses that are just going to go down the toilet right now. And I think they're going to get gobbled up by the bigger players. And, you know, that's cronyism. And I don't agree with that at all. You know, I'm a true blue capitalist, but I don't, I don't like cronyism by any means. And, you know, if you look at history and look at the big banking closures in the Great Depression and what happened with that, I think that you'll see a lot of the same things play out today. So, I don't know. That's what, that's what I'm watching with my money. And, it's, it's kind of a wait and see where we're still staying in a lot of, you know, dry powder, so to say, you know, we're staying in cash positions. We want to see how it will play out. Um, but yeah, those, those, of, those are the people in the world who think that this is all going to turn around in a six weeks or eight weeks and we'll all be back to work and it'll all be back to normal. I'm so sorry, but it, it just will not be. You need a, a good wake up call. You need to be shaken a little bit, you know? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Well, let me ask you this then. This is something I've been debating with. When it comes to capitalism, like pure capitalism, the idea that some of these, uh, these industries, when you're looking at um, airlines, the, the, the cruise industry, um, casinos, mm -hmm. uh, pure capitalism would say those that survive, um, uh, there's a supply demand and, and we'll see how they rebound. But so what, what's your take on most likely and, and it's already happening with this, with this last round of um, stimulus. Mm -hmm. There's going to be other additional rounds of stimulus. What's your, what's your take on that, where we could be bailing out industries like the cruise industry, which mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it, ha just... it has a lot of employees, but at the end of the day, it's not something that's a, a, necess a necessity. Mm -hmm. um, we're, both, we're both travel lovers, but at the end of the day, if it's, if it's not needed and why would it have to be bailed out? I, I, don't, I don't understand that point of view on that. Okay. Well, I think that in general, 
not not overly so, but in general, we learned a lot from 2008 and the bailouts then. And I think that bailing out big banks who are doing risky derivative projects left a bad taste in many people's mouths. Now, a lot of the bailouts are happening for small businesses, which is kind of different, you know? Um, bailing out monster corporations you know, I don't think that's the right answer. Now, providing loans to small businesses, that sounds a little bit better. You know, I don't know about everybody just basically sticking their hand out and getting, you know, UBI, universal basic income. I don't think that's the solution by any means. But there has to be some type of uh, a happy medium. Um, I think definitely postponing the, the deadlines for filing of taxes is a smart move. Um, I'm not a fan of the stimulus packages. Two trillion dollars that they've just dropped in with QE5 is unbelievable. You 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 can see it on the streets today. And just to use another very micro micro example, um, I opened up Amazon today. It's on my head because I ordered all this stuff. And literally every single thing in my shopping cart, I got a notification that everything has gone up by one dollar. Now. That's literally inflation in front of your eyes. And, you know, usually it's 2%, 3% a year. But when you drop $2, two trillion, which is a number that human beings really cannot fathom, the difference between, say, $2 trillion and $2 billion. Like, it's, it's so astronomical that humans just, they, they can't get their head around it. And that's just been pumped into the economy. That means every single dollar that you have in your bank account is worth less today in real terms, in real purchasing power is worth less. It's like you've just been stolen for, from, you know? And everybody who's listening to this, they just got ripped off, you know? So- And like, it's only the first one. There's more. There's, yeah, exactly. Because right after the 2.2 was signed, there's already talk of another 2 trillion for infrastructure. So- Yeah, and then we do what? The US national debt is something like 2.2, 2, sorry, 22 oh. trillion. Yeah. And just all of a sudden, like, boom. Let's just add another two. Let's add another two. Yeah. And if the socialists get in, you know, well, like Bernie's not going to get in, but I mean, if he did, his, his package over his term was supposed to be like $5 trillion with the UBI, with the Green New Deal, with all of these types of things. That's just mental. Like people are looking for a handout. People are looking for entitlement. And like, I don't agree with that at all. Um, I know that th times are difficult right now. Um, you know, Educate yourself and try to find ways that you can earn income. You know, there's a lot of programs out there. There's a lot of free resources for learning, you know, and there's a lot of people out there that who've been trying to wake people up and be like, all right, you need to get moving. You need to build a business. You have to have savings. What's a rainy, you need a rainy day fund. You need to have all these things in place. And it's like, I'm getting hundreds of emails from people now like, oh, can you do this for me? Can you set this up for me? And it's like, no, like yeah. it's gone like your chance is gone and i mean like i work in the offshore markets okay but i follow the law and like if the law changes and says i can't do this and you come to me in six months and say like can you set up this structure can you do this can you open my bank account overseas and the law has changed and i'm not allowed to do that anymore i'm not going to do it i'm not going to go against the law because i respect my own freedom and i want to protect my own family so it's like people need to move right now you know, you don't buy health insurance after you get in a car accident. You know, yeah. I don't understand how people think that they can do all these things after the crisis. There's still some wiggle room here, but I mean, a lot of doors are closing right now. There's a lot of options in my business that are just slowly, one by one, the doors are closing. Yeah, that's what, um, always adding skills to, to your toll, toolbox is, is what I always recommend to people because they would ask me on how we save money um, mm -hmm. to go on the trip that we went on. And my, I'm always one that says, find a way to make more money mm -hmm. instead of cut back to save money. Because if you add more skills and you're more valuable in the market, uh, that's going to make you um, be able to make you make more money. And in the long run, if you oh, can make more absolutely. money, you can afford it. Absolutely. Some Listen, I dropped out of school when I was 12 years old. Okay. I stopped going to school at 12 and 15. I was, I never went back. I was completely dropped out. I'm an autodidact. I'm a polymath. I'm completely self-taught. I literally have a library of like 2,000 books in my house in Panama that I brought with me over to the UAE. You know, I have no special abilities. I'm not like superhuman. I didn't have a, a, a bachelor's or a master's or a PhD. I mean, I went to the library 
and I read a lot of books. I read a lot of books on accounting and law. And, you know, I taught myself. I ask people. I have mentors. You know, people were nice enough to give me their time. I tried to generate value. We do that on the podcast. We do that in lots of ways. You know, it doesn't always have to come down to paying for something. There's other ways that you can pay. Go to YouTube. Start educating yourself. Whatever you have, whatever it is you want to do, this is the perfect time to invest in yourself and not spending all day watching Netflix. Like, <laughs> like I want to, like I open social media these days and it's just comments about the coronavirus, just memes about the coronavirus or what they're watching on Netflix. And it's like, tch, tch, tch. so much opportunity right now. Absolutely. Set yourself up for the future, please. And it's, it's the same people that were always ask, uh, man, I just wish life would pause for me so I could do these things that I like. And here it is right in front of you. And if you come out of the tail end of this, not doing anything, then you probably wouldn't have done anything anyway. Exactly. Listen, yeah. man, I'm, I'm taking a big Spanish program right now. Like I'm pretty fluent, but I mean, my reading comprehension is not great, but I'm doing like two, three hours a day of Spanish learning. I want to come out at the end of this quarantine and be like a gun. I want my Spanish to be so good. And that has to do with, that's also protection for me. You know, I want to be able to walk around the street and get by and help my family and ask for directions. And if, like we were talking about with the hospitals, I want to be able to do those things myself and not have to rely on someone else. You know, that's a great opportunity to learn something. It absolutely is. I got a buddy that lives in Vegas and his roommate is, is caught up in the hospital. He's a, he's a host at um, Hakkasan, one of the biggest nightclubs out there. And Beautiful. obviously it's, he got hammered by this. He spent mm -hmm. the last three weeks learning to, to become a tattoo artist. Bought all the bought all the tools, self taught cool. himself with YouTube. Um, now he's licensed and and he's doing tats in his in his house. It's unbelievable. But those are the types of things that as you yeah. can transition careers, you can use this time to transition careers exactly and, and do something amazing. Um, like I'm saying, it's an opportunity. You know, don't the, the people out there that just think like, "Woe is me!" It's the government's job to take care of me and hand out and expecting this stuff. You know, shame on you guys because. Really, you have a chance here to rebuild your life in the way that you want. And in a lot of ways, you're forced to do it. So like, take advantage of it. And you learn anything and everything on the internet for basically free. Or even if you don't, even if it's not free, pay the money. Like, God, I've spent, I don't know, $100,000, $200,000, $250,000 on online training and coaching and mentoring. You know? That's an investment. Like that's, 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 that's something I'm very happy for because I'm 37. My biggest investment is my own two hands. It's what I can create. It's what I can write. You know, that's how I'm going to generate more money. You know, I could put it into a house or the stock market. You know, I could, I could double my returns. I could triple my returns. But come on, man. That will never equal what I am able to, eat, to earn with my own two hands and with my mind. Absolutely. I mean, you'll, you'll see somebody, you'll see people, they'll spend easily a hundred bucks on Netflix during a year, but if there's a hundred dollar course, they'll think three yeah. or four they'll times. They'll be like, is this a scam? They'll be looking <laughs> yeah. up. It's like, no, man, a lot of these people, you know, these are professionals. They spend mm -hmm. so much time making mistakes. Like as an entrepreneur, do you know how many mistakes I make? I mean, I still make mistakes like nonstop on a daily basis. Like, and most entrepreneurs are like that, you know? Pay for those mistakes. Give the guy the hundred bucks so you don't have to make the same ones. So many people out there think that the best way to learn is from your own mistakes. This is bullshit. The best way to learn is from someone else's mistakes. Absolutely. If someone else has done it, try to avoid that. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Don't start from scratch. Don't start from zero. Learn as much as you can. Abraham Lincoln says, if you give me eight hours to chop down a tree, I'll spend the first five hours sharpening the ax. What does this mean? It means Sharpen your mind. It means get yourself ready. Be prepared. So when your time comes, when it's your chance to step up to bat, and you swing and you hit a home run. Absolutely. Make sense? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate this time. It's, it's um, very insightful and inspiring. Are there any last thoughts on this, um, I guess, this weird time we're going through and uh, anything you might want to leave the listeners? Well, just as I said before, take this stuff seriously. You know, you're all responsible for yourself. I'm a big, big, big one for personal responsibility. Don't rely on anybody else, you know. Take care of yourself. Take care of your family. Protect yourself. 
you know, if you want to find out more about what I do, you can go to expatmoneyshow.com. I've got a podcast. We've got just a ton of free content on there. We talk about the travels. I've had guys like Jim Rogers on the show, Grant Cardone. I've had you on the show, Matt. Um, lots of really smart people. Um, otherwise, you'll find me at escapeartist.com. It's the oldest offshore website in the world. I took over the site about a year ago. and We're doing some really exciting things over there. Awesome. Thank you, brother. I really appreciate it. It's great catching up. My pleasure. You too. I'll talk to you soon. I'll see you. See you. We're living yeah, now. So Dave from Cebu City, Philippines. Beautiful. Well, Dave, uh, great to talk to you, buddy. Um, as you know, I was just in the Philippines six weeks ago. Mm. And at the time, your president um, was way ahead of the curve, um, stopped the um, travel from China, Macau, and Hong Kong while we were there on February 2nd. And we could feel the intensity um, because the people were taking temperatures at certain hotels. They were even doing some body temperature scanning at the casinos my brother and I went to in Manila. But it seemed like it was, the Philippines hasn't been really a hot spot, but now from what I'm hearing, it's starting to pick up a little bit. Can you just give us an idea of what's happening? Um, well, you're seeing? yeah, so I think that that was a good thing because we're <laughs> in the Philippines, by the way, we always check anyone. <laughs> we do have uh, security oh. guards with a gun, right? <laughs> and oh, balls yeah. check everything. But you know, for 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 that, I, I think it was right now. It's what's happening really is realizing that our healthcare system is not as ready as any other country, as you might know. Uh, as Philippines has been struggling with that, uh, with the employees themselves. I mean, the yeah, health workers. Uh, it's it's not that many, if you should say. All of them are, or most of them, might have flow. You know, flew away working abroad, especially with nurses. So uh, yeah, so I think the main issue now is really w having that uh, getting infected, you know, it was in the in the community now. And that's, we're having issue containing it mainly because it's uh, <laughs> really, we're not prepared for that at all. I mean, this, we were just trying to avoid the cases to be in, but now that we're in it, it was like we're just preventing it because prevention is the key. But the thing is, because we all know that if it comes in, that's going to be a really big problem. That's what exactly happened. Yes. Yeah, so, so you guys are seeing a rise in cases then? And uh, luckily in my province, but okay, so here's the thing. We don't have that much testing kits. That's what's happening. There are a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, people are getting into the the suspected cases, but they're not tested. And mm -hmm. unfortunately here in Cebu, even in my local, so I'm not from the main, uh, like, you know, the in Manila. So they have a lot of cases there. It's over 3,000 now, uh, as I last checked. But here in Cebu, we had like just 20 people infected or 30 people but the thing is, we haven't tested as many people and people are dying. So okay. that's the scary part. Yeah, it is because um, I think that they'll probably, they'll understand obviously that they're dying from either COVID or something that has yeah. extreme respiratory problems. And then because this is going around, they would, it would point to that. Have, has anybody in your family or your friend group or anybody that you know come down with um, COVID-19? Well, uh, for me personally and my family, I was like, I'm, I'm just blessed that I were able to like just sit down in the house, like truly be quarantined. Uh, here in the Philippines, we are only allowed one person from the household to go out. Wow. Uh, yeah, so that's a good way to prevent it. But nonetheless, it, they can't control that. I don't think a lot of people are checking it. So, uh, yeah, so we don't have any direct people who are affected, but I know a couple who their aunt or uncle was affected. So it's in my circle. So it's getting real. And my mom, she wasn't believing it at all. Like she wants to go to church when this first thing happened, right? She's a bit religious, yeah. uh, the Catholic church. But, you know, when they knew someone in their circle, in the church group that uh, died out of uh, Corona, 
Uh, so she's like sticking at home. She's praying a lot now, a lot more. You know, we got a lot of altars now in at home. That's that's wild. Yeah, um, similar in America. Um, some non-believers until it hits groups around you, and then you, mm. you understand that this thing is real. Uh, and I, like you said, church, uh, particularly ca um, Catholicism, is really big in the Philippines. Yes. Um, with it being Easter. Uh, coming up, yeah. This is probably a really difficult time because the Fili Filipinos are known for their their big group uh, parties and getting together. So, yeah. do you think people will restrict? Um, will the, will the, or there will there be still be some parties going on? Outside? Actually, not none at all. Uh, mm. And I don't even I haven't even heard any big movements from the church. I think we're just gonna stay at home. Like, uh, yeah. So no, because. Holy Week, you're correct. It's a big event here. I mean, not. If, I mean, it's a big thing here yes, where so people go to different churches. Yes. So uh, right now, that's all on hold. Uh, yeah, I don't know uh, what my parents are gonna do about it, but yeah. So it's it's really a Holy Week for everyone. Like, yeah, no, nothing. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty wild. And the other thing I was taking aback when I was in the Philippines was um, how much basketball playing there was uh, <laughs> not only the kids but the adults i gotta assume all of that has stopped or are kids playing at home like what what's going on with that you know what in fact in manila they're turning two coliseums into uh like the quarantine area that's oh. a yeah they're transforming it for those cases so uh i i doubt people would stop in a way where uh, you know, in the look in the inner part of the province, if you've been through there, if you go inside yeah. those, uh, you know, people would still be playing. I can hear kids still playing out, but in the city area, I bet it's uh, not that much. I think it's all restricted. But yeah, no one can stop the innermost, like in the province, in the mountainsides. You know, it's part of life. Uh, kids are going still going to play, but yeah, yeah, and that's what having these conversations with my friends around the world, some of the most difficult areas to keep an eye on are um, the, the underprivileged. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's some of those areas where there's a, a lot of population density. They're, they're probably a, a bit poor and it's mm. um, and so it's hard to one, it's hard for them to receive the message and take it into consideration, yeah. but just based on their life circumstances of mm. access to food, um, really living paycheck to paycheck. Relief, yeah. um, that, that's the hardest part. Is is that going to be difficult? And especially in a city like Manila, where you got 15, 16 million people, yeah, you know, lose like five or six million. Is that going to be difficult? So th that's exactly what's happening. I mean, people are actually you know living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, I did a quick search uh, prior. I mean, I did seminars before, and you know, I I did a quick search of the finance banking uh, like statistics. It's like 80% of the people only have like, you know, less than $100 in their bank account and who has bank accounts, right? 80% of them. And it's just like, wow. If you just imagine losing their job in just a week or even, a, you know, a couple of weeks, then that's going to be a big problem. That's why in Manila, I think that's one of the biggest uh, concern because of the density of people. The people still go to work. Uh, they, they can't, you know just stop it luckily this these days we're trying to uh, there's an enhancement of uh uh basically <laughs> a movement with the government where yeah there's an issue with that as well where where government are forcing on and uh the the military and stuff like that so yeah and a lot of uh, we're a bit divided into that who's like pro you know the government and all that and i think it's not the issue here it's about really just focusing on the problem and fixing on, you know, what's at hand, which is the virus. This is our common enemy. It's not like, yeah, but we'll, we're still seeing that it's all politic, you know, stuff like that going on. Yeah. I think that uh, it's just kind of the nature of it. When these things happen, the po politicians are going to take, find an advantage in, in, in some case. Let me ask you and this. People um, need to blame, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a hard, hard situation. Now, in in the Philippines, um, call centers 
are a really big part of the economy there. Uh, mm -hmm. I was I was taken aback at how well most people spoke English. And it I think it has to do with the idea that call centers are such an important part of the economy and, mm -hmm. and, and children learn to speak English um, very early, it seems. Are yeah. you are if your friends in that industry, are they losing their jobs? Actually not. They're still uh, the companies are actually doing their own measures to keep their, you know, keep their jobs and still go on for those who can work from home. They are able to do it. And I'm not sure if this is exactly what's happening right now because it's like our fourth week already, but on the early weeks, they are allowed to like go to the office and not leave in a way where they can live there where oh, everything's know. provided the food, like, you know, the, the hygiene stuff and, you know, uh, so, so they're kind of they quarantined can, at work. Yeah, somehow like that. It's just wow. to prevent that. But yeah, I think there was one, you know, uh, company. I'm not, I'm not sure at all, but the, it, that setting stopped just because someone was suspected to have uh, the virus. But yeah, I'd, for other companies, I think they're keeping themselves afloat by having that set up or just letting people work from home. Yeah, it's interesting. I was talking to some um, some business buddies of mine, and we're mm -hmm. talking about the idea in America how um, a lot of people are having the chance to work from home that typically wouldn't be able to work from home. And understanding how the Philippines continues to grow from like the virtual assistant and also mm -hmm. just more skills than just a, a typical VA, I yeah. can see this really helping a place like the Philippines in the long run because if you're giving, you're gonna let our business gonna, are going to let more people work from home. At some mm -hmm. point, they'll discover that that person that they're paying American money to with higher salaries could actually be the, the same job and same position could be outsourced to a place like the Philippines where you can get more bang for your buck because um, just the, the, the currency um, yeah. equivalent it's isn't in time. It's a total eye opener for most companies who are, you know, renting an office space and realizing they can function nearly as much or even at par with what they're providing. Well, while their people are at home, like they might be because they're, why are we paying rent when yeah. they can just work from home? Right. And yeah, that, that, that maybe is a next thought of it. Like, why am I hiring this? But I think this is like an equalizer for everyone. Like internet has been an equalizer for, for those who are aware of it, that it can be, you know, there's outsourcing in there. And, uh, but the thing is, uh, I always believe that, uh, and I've, I've actually got this from the podcast. I'm not claiming this at all from the shows that I've been editing, uh, from the clients that I've been hearing from smart people like you who are sharing their thoughts. Well, every recession or every, you know, crisis like this, it brings out the best of people, the best leadership and the best innovative, you know, ideas that comes out. And I'm looking for the, I'm hoping for the best mainly for what's happening now. This is definitely one of the, I, you know, one of the unique things that ever happened for the past century, I guess. I, I haven't heard, you know. Yeah, this is being, definitely a one of a kind situation that, exactly. Um, I mean, even generations back, there's nothing like this has happened um, for yeah. a very long time. And um, it's going to have a huge impact uh, on our. On yeah, our and if we survive this, this is going to be like amazing for the human race, I would believe. But because we're going to be ready for the next thing that's going to happen. And we're not just going to take viruses lightly. Absolutely. Right? I, I totally agree. Let me ask you this. Uh, when, when we were at the Philippines, we had a chance to, to see not only Cebu Island, but Manila. Um, mm. and the amount of animals that were, I, I love the freedom of the animals there because mm -hmm. um, goats, chickens, dogs, they seem to just have free reign and can, can uh, run around and whatnot. Mm -hmm. What is happening now to a lot of those stray dogs? Do people just, they, they still make the effort to put food out? Because when we were there, there was a, it seemed to be a lot of stray dogs in a situation like this where everybody's kind of, um, quarantined and isolated that might not have the same interaction with the animals because they're just not passing them by each day. Is that a concern at all? Or, or is there certain groups that help those dogs out? That's a really good question. And to be honest, I don't have any idea. All I, for my personal experience, I do hear dogs now 
like from yeah. from neighbors actually stray dogs as well they're like crying and all that i do hope you know someone and that's a really good idea i should check that out i mean these uh you know it's not just us that are affected these animals are also affected and although in the philippines stray dogs somehow have their own like owner because these animals actually go yeah. back to like their like their home base yeah they're, even they're if little, they yeah, yeah because people here in the philippines we throw out food like like in the backyard or something like that and just and cats, if you do that, like cats will automatically go to your, you know, place. Dogs will automatically go to your place. And yeah, so because we, yeah, we don't dispose like trash, like the food trash uh, in a way where we just put it in a trash bin, right? Uh, we call that here Lamau. So uh, it's <laughs> Lamau. Yeah, it's like uh, in the local dialect, it's like, uh, you know, just putting everything there, mix it all up like instead of like the bio you know the food waste we don't put it in trash we feel like it's you know and uh no one's gonna collect it it's like yeah <laughs> we don't have that a good disposal so we just keep it outside and that's where the food comes in for for most of these stray animals it's a, it's a sad reality but it, it's like an ecosystem still yeah absolutely <laughs> and the, the, all the animals we we came encounter with they all seem extremely happy um, and even though, <laughs> even though some of them were a little bit thin, you can tell they were enjoying their life. Right. Yeah. Let me ask you this. So, um, you are, we know each other because of, of the podcast community and, and your, your amazing ability to, to make podcast production. Thank You've you. got a, an American base for clientele. Have mm. you seen an uptick because you've got, I've, I know that in America there's, um, with this last month, there's people at home that have always maybe dreamed of doing a podcast. And now um, they've got this time where they've got a little bit of extra time. Now they're going to accomplish some of those goals. Are you seeing an uptick? Actually, I cannot like say it is an uptick. Like, you know, I've been still marketing a lot, but uh, I've noticed, yeah, I've noticed that I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm working more than I should be working. I think there's a lot of updates, especially with existing clients where they want to release more content. Oh, okay. I've, I've, there's like two or three who wanted to release more content relevant to the what's happening. But yeah, I mean, I think this is the right time for anyone who's, who wants to start it. And I, I've, I've, some people started, like contacted me for that, but I'm not really sure if it's be just because of the pandemic that they're at home hopefully not because once it all goes back maybe they're gonna stop but yeah the whole point of it is it it is indeed like a, the right i mean thinking under shoes it should be uh, a way for them and uh, i'm i'm waiting for that uh there i think the reason behind is like i also experienced it like th the first two three weeks it feels like people are not able to act like they're stunned yeah, because it's like, uh, wow, it's a it's a change. But these, I think, this week and the following weeks, it's going to be different. Where people are now, okay, this is the situation. How should I go about it? And I think that I'm gonna see more coming in. I'm excited for that. Oh, for excellent. The following weeks, yeah, yeah. It's it's weird when it comes to the podcast. My numbers are actually have been a little bit down, and I don't know if it's because of increased competition or because I'm in the travel category. And people just mm. aren't looking to travel. I mean, travel as a whole has just stopped. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm I'm assuming it's because travel is because right. I'm category, and a lot of my downloads are be are um, location specific. Actually, uh, I have an SEO guy who who mentioned this, and I'm not hundred percent you know sure if this is accurate. Just uh, you know, caveat for that. It, it's because the Google search algorithm are focusing on. The virus right now. That's why a lot of it, you know, it's it hasn't settled down yet. All COVID issues are like put there. So maybe if you add in a content of COVID in there, which is you are doing now, right? Yeah. yeah. So probably would uh, that would uh, go back. But uh, I've seen some of the people are actually getting back now with the uh, normal traffic. As, yeah. Because uh, yeah. I wasn't sure if it was because people are at home now and they they stop their like daily commutes. Mm -hmm. long walks potentially so they they, they change their patterns of listening or mm -hmm. and they're they're doing more more like um, tv screening of netflix yeah amazon Prime, and youtube 
And so they're doing less podcasts. But I've also um, read that some people are having increased um, mm. listeners. So I, was, I, was, I, I wasn't sure exactly why my numbers are down, but uh, I just assume it's because the travel category. And that's my, that's my hope because I'm hoping once we come out of this thing or during COVID um, content like this, maybe I'll see an uptick. But, but yeah, yeah, I was confused by that. I'm excited for your, you know, once this us all is over, I mean, I'm like excited to travel. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah I yeah. think that, um, I think we're going to see once we, once we get through this and, and we'll see how long it drags, because even in America, depending upon how long it's COVID-19 is here, we're going to have restrictions on where we can go. I've got a trip coming up in Morocco in June. It's probably not going to happen. I'm almost positive it's not going to happen. But even if I could go, they would probably say I'd have to be quarantined when I arrive to the country. So mm. it won't even be a fun trip if, yeah. if I even went there. So you're probably going to see some huge delays in how long uh, Americans can travel elsewhere um, or to, to particular places. So yeah, there's going to be a lot of people that just cannot wait to go yeah. to, um, even if it's in different places in, in the U.S. or uh, travel abroad, like, like, you know, I love to do, um, see different mm. parts of the world. So yeah, I would assume that there's going to be um, a lot of pent up demand that is, is going to break out once this thing rolls through. What, um, anything else that, and obviously you're working a ton, um, you're probably in a good flow. Is there anything else you are working on personally in, during this time, whether it's like self-development or anything you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, I mean, uh, personally, this is like my first time as well, letting my team work from home. I, I'm kind of like the control freak here. <laughs> I had, yeah, I, I love the systems and I'm going to make sure that they all have the same. We're using all the same app and stuff like that and the same, you know, OS and all of that. So it, it, it was a new thing for me to let them work from home. So I'm trying to learn more about entrepreneurship. I'm actually enrolling into this Harvard uh, free online business, you know, stuff. Yes. So I'm going to learn from that. And uh, I've been upgrading. It's it's really a good uh, impact in a way for me. I'm not, you know, don't quote me on this in the future times, what we don't know what's coming up. But for me, it, you know, I tried to adapt and just learn. I actually upgraded some of my stuff here with the audio, the processes, you know, purchase some. I know it's not a good time to purchase something, but I, I purchased some upgrade just to, and, you know, try to learn more about in depth about how pod uh, audio engineering works and yeah, just learning. And I'm planning to uh, uh, create my own course, I guess, uh, just making the most out of time, you know, be an influencer in a way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, uh, start some YouTube video, like trying to be a positive, uh, you know, just sh sh giving that positive dose in the online world. That's the least I can do, especially while I'm at home. So, that's really Got smart it. because that really, um, especially with your business model, um, learning how to do those those courses could be something else that you fold into um, mm -hmm. what what you're providing to your clients. So that's a really good idea. Yeah. Um, any anything else you want to? Any final thoughts on what we're going through right now, or any anything you want to yeah. share? Yeah, I think uh, just maybe this is a question for everyone who's listening to this, or to you, Matt. I mean, we. Like how, what, how long do you think this would last? Like, I want to let, I always ask people around, do, do they have any prediction with it or, you know, how are they handling it? If this is going to draw, draw on, like, how about you? I've been. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, I'm kind of a realist. Um, yeah. and I'll tell you when, when I, with my two weeks in the Philippines in seeing how your country was handling it. And then we threw, we flew through Korea on our way back. And as we flew through Korea, we were greeted by those folks that were in hazmat suits. And mm -hmm. it, it was real at that time. So mm -hmm. I knew um, when we came back and we had limited checks when we entered America, um, they didn't, they, all they really asked us was if we had been to China. That was the only question they had asked us. And uh, as soon as you said no, they just let you on through. There was no test going in. And that, mm -hmm. was, that was February 15th. So I, I knew coming home that it was going to be on our doorsteps real soon. I could just, I could feel it. And uh, uh, I, I anticipated it happening. Uh, so over those next three weeks, I was pretty um, not anxious, but ready. And I was having a lot of conversations with my friends and family 
of just yeah. be prepared, it's coming. So then as we, we made the, the shutdowns in mid-March, um, mentally I was ready for it. And so I've been kind of realistic about the entire thing. And the idea is, in America is we, we just want to just go so fast. We want to just, it's just kind of the, the mentality of um, create things now, create them faster, create them bigger, and just move on. And I think that we are really uh, anxious to get this thing over with. And it just, it's just yeah. not how it works. It's, it's, a, it's a virus. It, you can't rush it. It's going to have its own course. So my fear is we're gonna, there's going to be different pockets through America. Obviously, New York is the one that has it now. Um, Florida, I think Florida is gonna, not going to be too far behind just because of how they handled it. And they've got a big uh, population of elderly people there. And then I think it's going to have different pockets around the country. Um, so if, if America has four or five countries within it, we're going to drag on for a while. And I don't think we, we're going to get out of it anytime soon. So I think whether the lockdown lasts for a long time or not, I think we're going to be into June or July before we get back to some sort of normal. Um, they're yeah. talking about sports. I don't even I don't even know how that's a question right now because it just doesn't even seem like it's uh, even in the realm of possibility that we get groups together in it in the near term at all. So I th I think we, we're still I think it's going to be a gonna while. It's going to drag long, yeah. I really do. I think it's going to be a while uh, in our country. I think all, there's going to be a lot of differences in a lot of countries around the world, mm. um, depending upon how early they reacted. And yeah, but it's just. It just seems like, um, and now you look at Japan, Japan handled it really well early on. And then Tokyo just went into lockdown um, starting today. Um, so if for a month. Mm. And they, so, and they, they, they've been ahead of it for six weeks. So, yeah. so my concern is even if you're ahead of it, how long does it linger and how long mm. is it apart? Because um, it looks like Sweden is, was attempting to just go on with life as normal. And the, with the idea yeah. that the people would get it and then they would react to it, but it overwhelms the healthcare system and yeah. the hospitals, hospitals get overwhelmed. So you can't really do that. Mm. So it's, I think it's just one of those things where it's, it's going to take a lot longer than people are, want to happen. Um, and uh, in, in a lot of the conversations we're already seeing is, is, a, is like, okay, let's get back to work uh, in America. I just don't think it's possible. Because as soon as you as soon as you rush it and people are around each other, there's just going to be more and more outbreaks. Um, but if we can stay isolated like we're doing, this is what you have to do in order um, to to really calm down um, those peaks that you're trying to avoid because you just overwhelm the healthcare system. And with my wife being in healthcare, that's the thing I'm hoping to avoid the longest. Yeah. I just don't want her to be in a hospital um, getting exposed. Yeah. So, so yeah, I'm I'm. I'm being very patient, um, staying, trying to stay as um, positive as I can, but being extremely productive in the meantime, I'm used to this lifestyle. Uh, this, this lifestyle is not a big thing to me. Nikki and I lived it for 27 months as we traveled. We're really good at just, just doing our own thing um, remote. Um, I, I don't mind working from home. I can, I can be extremely productive in this setting, but there is a segment of the population that has to make their money in restaurants yeah. and entertainment and, and exactly like that. so it's it's really tough but yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in for the long haul yeah i hope i hope there's like a vaccine or cure coming soon i think that's the only solution to this yeah and yeah so or the yeah so the antibody test to know that you had it because i'm hope i'm partly hoping that i had it um because when we came back from from asia i was yeah yeah I was pretty sick. So, oh, man. I, yeah. So I don't know if, if I got exposed when we were in Korea, my, my brother was really sick um, for two weeks and then his wife and son both got extremely sick and I was sick for like the last uh, four or five weeks. Nikki was sick. So I'm hoping we had it. I'm really hoping we had it. Um, so that's yeah. why I'm waiting for the antibody test that maybe I can get tested and say, okay, you did, you went through it. And then that, I think once people have that, once people have the antibody test, there's going to be a yeah, sensor they can go back normal. to know like, okay, at least, at least if, if I get exposed, this, I'm, I'm going to be okay. And I can mm. go back out in public. Um, so I yeah. think that'll be a big hurdle to, to get over. Yeah. 
All right. Yeah. So. Cool, man. Well, thanks, brother. I, I appreciate your time jumping on yeah. like this. Uh, 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 obviously, it was great seeing you six weeks ago. And I wish you the best of luck, man. Make make the most of this. Make uh, however you can. Uh, great ideas, which you're doing already. Yeah, I will. And hope you do as well. Let me know how can I help you, you know. Absolutely, yeah. brother. Thanks, Dave. I'll see you, man. See you.